Well, thank you and good afternoon. And uh, welcome to your capital city. We're uh, delighted to have you from every reach of the Commonwealth, uh, from Wise and Scott, Lee, Pulaski, to uh, Fairfax, Arlington, to Hampton Road, Southside, and some of you just from the Richmond area. Uh, welcome uh, to the capital city. Mayor Council, thanks for your uh, introduction and for uh, your leadership uh, in, uh, well, I guess we can still sort of call you Hampton Roads, Western, far Western Hampton Roads, and worked on a number of things uh, together with the mayor over the years and uh, doing a great job and I appreciate your leadership with the organization as well as uh, Jim Campbell, who I've worked with for a decade plus uh, during my time in the, uh, in the General Assembly. Uh, I want you to know we prayed for you this morning. It was at the National Prayer Breakfast, and uh, from President Obama to senators, congressmen, it was nice to have everybody join together in prayer for people at every level of government. So, given some of your budgets, you need it, and, uh, and I'm, you should be glad to know that you were uh, thought of well this morning. Uh, we're glad you're here, and I hope you get a chance, in addition to your meetings and talking about best practices and trying to figure out what uh, is going on with the budget and all my amendments and all the things that are going on here just a couple days before crossover, uh, that you do get a chance to uh, spend some time with your legislators, look them in the eye, tell them what's important to you, what you like, what you don't like about what's happened in the session, and uh, remind them about your own uh, legislative uh, packages. I think it's critically important to have leaders from, uh, from BML, they go from local government up here, uh, communicating with your legislators about uh, what you'd like to see. Uh, you know, I say a lot about uh, some of the intrusiveness or the overreach of our federal government and what they're doing here and why government closest to the people works the best, why the Tenth Amendment still means something. And uh, I know you feel the same way as well when it comes to dealing with your state government, that uh, you all being locally and duly elected and having regular meetings right there with the people that they all got your cell phone and uh, your emails and regularly communicating with you that uh, you likewise uh, know a lot more probably than what we do in Richmond about what the needs and prayers are. Uh, so um, I wanted to uh, say that I think uh, we have some better days ahead. It's been a darn tough two or three years for all of us. I know. And there have been many challenges. Many of you are probably maybe newly elected. Uh, many of you probably have maybe been in this for 20, 30 years. This is my 20th year in elected office. And I can say that the last two have clearly been the most difficult from a fiscal standpoint. The only two years in Virginia history where we've had negative revenue growth back to back, where we've had to make incredibly tough decisions that have affected most of our 8 million citizens, certainly have affected you and the kind of money we've sent down to you. And it's called, called uh, for your uh, highest and best thinking about how to manage in these tough uh, fiscal times. And I want to start by saluting you and commending you uh, for doing that. You've uh, stood up and you've been heard about what the needs are, but at the same time you've taken uh, the revenues that have come from state or federal government, made the best of them, and found ways to do things smarter, uh, more entrepreneurial, make the cuts and make the tough choices, look at your citizens in the eye, and, and um, you know, it's not, not easy. And we've done the same here, but I can tell you that some of that that we did has now begun to bear fruit in some ways. And I, I mean this. I've seen a state government, 103,000 state employees, which is a little bit less than we had a couple of years ago. We also have uh, about $10 billion less overall than what we spent a couple of years ago. Between Governor Kane and I, we've cut that much out over the last uh, three years or so. But what we found is people are doing things in a different way. It's something that uh, I think the voters have been telling all of us for a couple of years that they want you to do more with less. I mean, they tell us that a lot, but in particularly these last couple of years, with this extraordinary economic uh, downturn with a very high unemployment rate, unfortunately down to 6.7%, uh, in Virginia, one of the lowest in the country, uh, there is still an awful lot of, of heartache in our citizenry and still uncertainty about what state, local, federal governments are going to do and how that's going to affect growth in the private sector. And so we've seen a lot of people doing a lot of things in very smart ways at every level of government to de deliver you know, those services. As a result of the cuts that we made last year, and I know they were tough uh, at the state level. Uh, we turned a $1.8 billion deficit around, and we finished the fiscal year with a 
$403 million surplus, one of the few states that actually ended up uh, the year with a surplus. Now, tough choices to be able to get there. At the same time, what we also uh, did is try to invest in those areas that would create long-term uh, support for private sector growth, job creation, economic development, uh, so that uh, we had a ticket to longer-term economic recovery. The General Assembly gave me about $65 million in new money last year. We put that to work, and as I mentioned, the job creation numbers, while not evenly distributed around the Commonwealth, as many of you have seen, particularly in Southside, Southwest, and other rural areas, we have, uh, over the last couple, uh, last year, uh, created about, uh, when I say we, I mean the economy, about uh, 65,000 net new jobs, ranking Virginia fourth uh, in the country behind Texas, Pennsylvania, and California, all much bigger states. So there's some positive things happening in Virginia, uh, slight surplus, some uh, economic growth. We're growing now at uh, a little over 5% in Virginia. The last two years, the last two months have been about, about a 9% revenue growth. So I'm not here to tell you the good times are rolling again and that we've made a full recovery and that you uh, can get whatever budget requests you might want from uh, from Richmond, but I'm, I'm here to say that there is there are some positive developments in the revenue area uh, that give me cause for hope, and hopefully you as well as we uh, exit from this economic, this global economic downturn. I would say Virginia has exited from it better than most, looking at the unemployment rate, the net new jobs, and the number of new companies that are looking at at Virginia. It's a it's a good story to tell, and I hope that. You know, collectively, we ought to feel pleased with the kind of climate that we have all worked to create in Virginia, with government working together with the uh, private sector, a good tax and regulatory climate, right to work laws, some of the best colleges uh, and universities and community colleges in all uh, of America, one of the top ranked public education systems. And we've got a good story to tell to continue to be a magnet for business and industry. In long term, that is what is going to make it easier for you in managing your budgets and uh, growing is our reliance on the economic engine of the private sector to provide the dreams and opportunities and, and uh, jobs uh, that we need to keep uh, this great state uh, moving in the right direction. So with that, let me tell you about uh, four priorities that I have during the course of this, uh, this uh, session. Even though we have a slight surplus, I made the decision that we are still in a period, uh, like you all are at local government level, uh, is reprioritizing, setting priorities, saying what's important for the future vitality and prosperity of your communities, and then making sure that your budget reflects that. So I cut about another $200 million out of the existing budget in, in areas that I thought were lower priorities or areas we could do things better or realize more economies of scale, and put that into some other areas that I think are higher priority. Let me tell you about a couple of them. One is uh, higher education. We have great universities, as I've uh, mentioned, about 15 four-year universities, about 23 community colleges, a number of private universities that also provide world-class opportunities in the state. We should all be pleased with, with that. All the rankings show that Virginia is one of the best places in America to educate a child, whether it's K-12 or higher ed. But the problem is we don't have enough access to higher education for young people in Virginia. College tuitions have doubled in the last 10 years, settling and particularly middle class kids with a decade or so of debt. And we've got to do better in the areas of science, technology, engineering, math, healthcare, some of these disciplines that you know are going to be part of the growth sector in the economy in the future. Things that frankly a lot of our global competitors in the Pacific Rim have already gotten and they're beating us with engineers and statisticians and scientists. And so we have outlined a, a plan uh, after a six months uh, study uh, to try to reshape the, the model uh, of how we fund and uh, manage our higher education uh, system. I put $75 million of new money into the budget uh, this year for our colleges and universities focusing on STEM, degree completion, community colleges, technology, student financial aid, the things that I think are important. And we've asked our university presidents to work with us, find ways to reduce spending in lower priority areas, pour it into that higher priority areas, and 
and uh, have more students come. Our goal is 100,000 new degrees over the next 15 years. I think that's a bold but important vision uh, because uh, right now, uh, somewhere around 38% or so of Virginia students will actually go to a Virginia uh, university. And we think, we think you know, when you look at what young people are gonna need to get the well-paying jobs in the future, uh, the majority are going to need at least an associate's degree in many four years or more. So this is the ticket to greater access to the American dream. Delighted to say that bill passed 98 to nothing yesterday in the House of Delegates, and I think it's well on its way through the Senate with uh, strong bipartisan leaders in both houses uh, that are championing the bill. Secondly, Mayor, you mentioned that uh, the T word, that's not taxes, that's transportation uh, this year, and uh, we have uh, made that a uh, strong priority. I grew up in Northern Virginia and uh, lived 21 years uh, in Virginia Beach, the two most uh, significant uh, congestion areas uh, of our state. Other areas of uh, the state need roads more for economic development and certainly the coal fields just to get from point A to point B, but everybody has transportation needs, whether it's roads, bridges, multimodal mass transit, and, and others. Uh, oftentimes what we do in Richmond is the art of the possible just like your boards of supervisors and your city councils. And this year I thought what was possible was to accelerate debt that we had previously authorized in 07 but hadn't issued much of. To utilize um, the receipts that we found during a significant audit of the Department of Transportation which we found about a billion four not being used properly and leverage federal funds with some of those toll credits to draw down money that we could use for Garvey bonds. And then thirdly, to create something that many of you have given us feedback that you like, and that is an infrastructure bank to be able to help fund local and regional projects that are in the six-year plan that are either unfunded or underfunded so we can help give you lower cost loans or loan guarantees or direct grants uh, so that you can get some regional projects built. Uh, all told, the plan uh, that we've outlined uh, has the goal of uh, providing $4 billion over the next three years. That's about the largest investment in transportation since about 1986. I'm delighted to say those bills have rolled out of committee with strong bipartisan uh, votes, and I'm uh, reasonably optimistic that they will, will pass. We're still working on some details on the amount of money to go in the infrastructure bank, but uh, I think the major component of it with the use of bonding is uh, well on its way to passage. Because here's the issue. I, we're getting the best deals in modern Virginia history at the lowest interest rates in modern Virginia history. We got a AAA bond rating. I took leaders up to New York to Wall Street three weeks ago. Wall Street's happy with this bonding package. They're happy we're taking on issues like transportation. And so we need to be able to use our great assets of a AAA bond rating to leverage our resources, issue this debt. The other thing is, I get people back to work now we can create congestion relief projects now, and uh, you can see the benefit in your localities uh, now. And so uh, I'm very pleased with the progress that General Summons made in the last couple of weeks, and uh, they're actually voting on that bill in the House as we speak, I think. So hopefully you'll see good news on that by the end of the day. But uh, Mr. Mayor, as you said, that's not the end of it. That is a major step forward, and I know as we go forward that we need to still find some ongoing sustainable revenues dedicated to transportation that can uh, give you the uh, resources that we all need to get some of these projects done. The third area, and I should have started with this because it's still the most important, is job creation and economic development. Uh, like most of you, I believe government doesn't, we don't create jobs, we don't create wealth, but we can do just the opposite if we have bad rules or oppressive taxation or we're not business friendly or we don't help the private sector because we don't have things like one-stop shops and other things that we put in place. And so we've uh, created this year yet another package of about $54 million in economic development incentives uh, to focus on things like research and development, uh, on technology, nanotech, biotech. We think we should be in that field in a big way because it's one of the core strengths of Virginia that uh, we should invest more in our aerospace and, ma and manufacturing industries. The President said to the State of the Union, we need to make things again. You know, we just can't just be a service industry and have everything going to India, China, other places. We've got to be in that business. And so we're trying to get people to repatriate with some centers from other countries back to Virginia and our country. 
and then to focus on other areas like tourism and film and wine and other things that uh, we've already got good base industries in uh, to be able to promote. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic that General Assembly will provide us a significant amount of new economic development incentives this year. Uh, working with people like the Tobacco Commission and the Virginia Economic Development Partnership, we've been able to put together a fair number of deals this year, getting North of Grumman to move from California to Fairfax County, Microsoft, the uh, largest investment in Southern Virginia history with their $500 million data center they announced in Mecklenburg County a couple of months ago, and many others uh, in, uh, in the pipeline that's allowing Virginia to keep up that great uh, pro-business uh, reputation. And we want to continue to do that and help you. And we urge you to use, have your local economic development partnerships work with, with ours uh, to be able to use our resources, which are far more than they were a year ago, uh, to be able to help you to close some of these deals uh, to get employers to come into your districts because it'll solve a lot of problems for you, getting people back to work, making that uh, new tax revenue uh, that you can then appropriate for good causes for your citizens. And then finally, things like uh, is government reform. It's something we always talk about. It's something that all of us at every level of government are always trying to do, to build the mousetrap a little better, to find new ways to do things. And we had a commission over the last year that recommended a, a number of things, from ABC privatization to four-day work weeks to closing different uh, agencies, uh, merging different boards and commissions, and a number of other things, all designed to cut overhead, make us more effective. And, uh, and efficient, and so several of those bills are rolling through the General Assembly. I want to talk about one that uh, has had some impact on you and explain what we're trying to do, and that has to do with pension reform. Uh, let me be as frank as I can. Our pension system is not in good shape. And virtually every governor in the country is dealing with this issue with the crushing amount of unfunded liabilities in our pension system, and you have the same problem at the local level. Same with the teacher pension system. Our recent report came out showing we had a $17.6 billion unfunded pension liability in Virginia. By the year 2014, only the pension system for state workers will be funded at about 61%, teachers at 57%. Uh, it would take a 44% stock market return to get you back to a, basically a, a break-even point. That's not happening. So we, we all have a collective problem. And I have laid out a plan. Uh, that is tough, uh, but it will help to restore some solvency in the system. And there are many ways to get there, but what I have suggested, and I know it's great some hardship and some controversy with you, and that is to uh, require the state employees to pay a full 5% of their retirement. We're one of only four states in America that requires zero contribution from state employees. Firstly, nobody in the private sector does because they're all either getting some uh, employee contribution, or they've got a completely defined contribution already. So uh, this is uh, something where we are out of step and not in good shape in our state. And I'm determined this year and in the future to not pass this problem on to another governor. Let's take this head on and work it together. It's not easy to do because the plan that I've suggested is have the state employees pay 5%. I'll make it up with a 3% pay raise so they have a net 2% increase of uh, uh, pay that they will be making for the first time in 27 years into the pension system. At least in the first year, I'm offsetting that with a 2% bonus that employees can earn based on performance and based on spending uh, reductions. I think it is a responsible plan. It generates $300 million in the retirement system a year, about $4.2 billion over the next 10 years, and starts to reverse that very ugly curve in our pension systems that most of us are facing. Now, there's some other options out there. There was a defined contribution mandatory bill uh, that is, uh, has been killed. There is a bill that is being, uh, getting through the House. There will be an optional defined contribution bill that will allow employees to essentially go with the defined benefit bill they have now or opt for about an 8% contribution that they can get and then invest like a 401k and manage their own retirement. A lot of young folks, I think, in particular, that are new employees will probably take that on. Uh, so we're trying with several different options to address this pension problem head on. Because at the end of the day, our biggest responsibility is to be able to tell those employees that promised benefit's going to be there for you when you retire. And uh, I, with the trends that I see right now, we've got some problems really honoring that promise unless we make some changes. So those are just some of the things that we're working on uh, this session of the General Assembly, uh, the uh, budget 
uh, that uh, the houses are working on are going to be due out Sunday. I've made about 400 amendments to last year's budget. I know some of them are dizzy. Uh, some of them are ones that uh, have not been uh, have been well received, and some of them I know on things like changing the uh, whole harmless in the LCI. I know some of you have given us feedback that you're not pleased with that. But if we begin to basically throw um, throw under the bus the uh, local composite index, which has been our mainstay for education funding for 40 years, it's going to be a political free for all every year in education funding. So we may want to talk about what does that formula look like in the future. But what we can have is every time we uh, adjust the uh, index, which happens every two years, that we basically just put in a whole harmless because that, that defeats the whole purpose of having an index. And I know some of you would like to have us look at that formula, look at the transportation formula, to see if it's still fair and equitable to all the jurisdictions. There'd be very different views, my guess, in this room uh, about that issue, and I understand that as well. Uh, but I do think we ought to, uh, when things haven't been updated in a while, we ought to take a fair and honest look at how we're uh, divvying up the $80 billion of taxpayer sent us over two years. Let me close by saying how much I appreciate you know, what you do uh, for our state. Uh, you are the front lines of government. You are the most visible part uh, of, uh, of government. People have to call or fax or email or ride to Richmond to see us uh, for the most part, although I'm traveling quite a bit. Uh, but you are right there, uh, completely accessible on a regular basis to your citizens. It's, uh, it's a tough job. And I appreciate it. And we want to continue to listen to you. I am looking at ways to uh, take seriously this pledge that we have made up here about no more local unfunded mandates. We've done enough of that. Here. I'm complaining about the ones I get from Washington, and so I don't want to have a double standard. We have actually talked to your leaders about which ones that are in place now that we could possibly uh, repeal or, or otherwise uh, do away with or modify so that we give you more flexibility. I'm very open to that. I do believe in the Dillon rule, but you know you all are duly elected, and, and we ought to talk about what that mix is uh, the, uh, you know, as we go forward. But um, thanks for your great service to, uh, to our state, to your localities. I think we, um, as I've spent this last year meeting with other governors and traveling a little bit around the country and, and talking to others, Virginia is generally held up as a model of good and clean and effective government. It's not just because of Richmond. It's because of what you do, uh, what we do in Richmond, how we work with the private sector. And uh, that's why a lot of people want to move here. That's why we have 8 million people, according to the last, uh, last census, is because we continue to be a beacon of freedom. We honor our founders' principles. Uh, we try to attract business and free enterprise uh, uh, people from the free enterprise system all the time so that we can grow and create more dreams for our people. That's a great thing. So God bless you. Thanks for your service. Look forward to working with you these next couple of years.